Can you hear me? Is the microphone working? Oh, great. Um, it's great to be here, and I I wasn't uh, I arrived in Australia about two weeks ago, but I was completely out of internet connection, so I'm really surprised that we managed to pull it out, <laughs> and much bigger with much bigger audience and with alcohol in your hands. <laughs> this is probably the first talk when audience are drinking alcohol, uh, which is quite special. Um, you may be wondering uh, what, what this is. Um, and this is uh, one of my favorite artists from Korea. His works are uh, mostly in installation pieces. And this is one of the, um, uh, this one was uh, installed in Korean Cultural Center in London in a passage that people can walk through. And if you look closer, the installation is made of common baskets used everywhere in Korea, like this mobile fish sellers. Um, and you see uh, lots of different styles of installation, but uh, with, a sh with a basically same principles. Um, the objects are in, this, in his work uh, are appropriated beyond their typical use and provide a completely different or unrelated experience to the audience. So the, re the reason why I like this series of installations using baskets is simply because it challenges my perception of objects that are considered very trivial. Um, it's almost like discovering the new potentials of these mundane baskets. So um, I did wonder whether I should give a very similar talk that I gave in Web Design, um, Web Direction South this morning, but I thought that that talk will be available online in video anyway. So um, I thought I would like to provide you for a moment um, to consider different perspectives on things that we don't normally give much thought or take for granted. So um, here's another photo, and it's not about art anymore. So shown in the photo is a garbage pile turning almost solid ground. Um, between the road and the open sewer in a slum in Mumbai. When I took this picture, children were basically running around on this ground, bare feet. They are not in this picture because they were all behind me trying to um, see the photos and touch the cameras, basically. Um, I picked this image as um, this probably represents a stereotypical, um, probably a little bit extreme image of what we call developing countries or emerging markets for many people um, around the world. And if I turn this image into words, um, they would be something along the line of poverty, lack of education, sanitation, or infrastructure. And these words uh, all hold some truth, a level of truth. Um, because looking back at my past years living in India or traveling around these communities, Stories I do get to tell my friends and family do come to a large extent from these. So I had my share of struggles with water and electricity supplies, and I had to come to terms with living with a nature, like cows on the street, or the smell of open air toilet and sewer, or cockroaches in the house, or often in food, and occasionally on your face while you sleep. So they do say that there are more mobile phones than toilets in India. Um, but we see the growing economies making the transition really fast from the poverty into societies with um, thick middle class with material wealth, and hence producing more people with more spending power. And that's exactly why I feel bitterness uh, with the term emerging market. If we consider the emerging market as mere reference to the new class of people uh, who would buy the stuff that we designed and produced already because they can finally afford it, then for design professions, it would be already emerged markets. But instead, if we focus on the characteristics of the changes happening and the cultural background, I think it's giving us much more exciting ground for new opportunities, especially for designers. And I would like to talk about a few reasons why today. So in this picture, do you recognize the gentleman on the left? Um, he's uh, Wen Jiaobao, a Chinese prime minister, and uh, Tony Blair. And do you see anything unusual in this picture? I'm going to turn around and look at the camera. <laughs> 
<laughs> Good point. I didn't notice that myself. Well, I lived in London for a while now and had lots of foreign friends. Uh, one of them, uh, a Finnish guy, had his style transformation after he moved to Lon London. And he always um, wearing, he was always wearing suits. As you can imagine, it is quite rare in design office to see someone in suit unless they are going for an interview, a job interview. <laughs> and he said, um, I'm adopting British ethnic clothes. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it is in a way true. And this is a picture uh, of the factory workers um, in Edinburgh, uh, taken in 1930s. And, and as you can see, it was a kind of regular uh, clothing for any context. I mean, at that time, we didn't have the fashion industry developed enough to categorize and come up with a different style of clothing. So workers were wearing the suits, as we see it now. Um, I guess the clothing norm changed considerably in the developed world since then. And globally, the new norm in men's business uh, attire is basically the British ethnic clothes for some reason. From that perspective, Mr. Blair is wearing his own native clothes, but Mr. Wen Bao is wearing a foreign clothes. Um, and I, I have to give you a, probably a bit different example because um, it didn't really uh, come to my mind before I went traveled extensively uh, in India or in other countries uh, with a different traditional costumes. So if you travel to Indian countryside or on the streets of um, kind of common kind of bit poor background uh, in Bangalore, this is what you will see. Uh, this uh, sexy mini skirt is called lungi. It's a casual wear um, in India. Uh, people would uh, use it at home, or the workers uh, would use it basically for every purpose. It's probably less known than uh, sari, because very few men in India are now wearing this. A lot of my middle class friends uh, in India cannot even know how to wear them because the tradition is uh, disappearing really fast with middle class. And um, another example is uh, this, uh, this is a gentleman called Vizeya Kant. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it, his name properly. He's a bullet film star and a politician. And in his uh, campaign poster, he's showing himself in, in, on the left side uh, in a very traditional Indian clothes as well as full Western style with sunglasses on. Um, and on the left, um, it's a bit similar to uh, Lungi on the previous page, but this is um, called Dhoti, which is a formal attire. It's essentially the same format, but it has to be clean, crisp white, which is a, a, a sign of uh, respect and um, effort in India. And this is uh, another example. Um, these of shifting identities, uh, which give them a certain sense of choice. And somehow in countries like India for now, opting for Western clothes is associated with a progressive and in a way cooler image. Uh, in Nokia Bangalore office, ladies had a casual Friday when they would come to office in Western clothes instead of their tr traditional clothes. And um, this family, um, um, of a grandmother with three uh, granddaughters. Um, so two of the granddaughters were very traditional in some, in, in many senses. Uh, they were looking, all looking uh, forward to getting married. While the youngest one uh, was planning to open a beauty parlor. So she was wearing Western style, clo style clothes all the time uh, because for her, it was to make a statement to people around her to differentiate uh, from those people who uh, think and choose the path of light, which is more traditional. Um, and this is another example, um, which uh, is from Vietnam. I was quite puzzled when I saw this. I thought at first this might be a children's toy. Can anyone tell what this is? Uh, so, did you say, can you speak? Oh, it's for funerals when they burn it as like ancestral offerings. Yeah, exactly. So it's, um, there is a tra tradition of burning valuables at the funeral. The idea is that the, the deceased will be able to bring the burned item with her and use it in the afterlife. So I quickly found the mobile phone <laughs> became part of the pack 
And this was back in 2006. So developing countries or growth economies typically have very turbulent history since um, 20th century. With a life in transition, with the influx of new things and changes, there is a spot of flexibility in people's mind that is completely free from uh, preconceptions of how things should be. So um, and another example, which I unfortunately don't have any uh, videos or photos, photos of, was um, Christian church in South Korea a few years ago. And you would imagine churches in Europe um, being very uh, established um, kind of space with very uh, known architectural style uh, and decorations. But this space was uh, completely in a modern building. And they were using uh, karaoke style uh, video uh, projections for singing the church choir, uh, church songs, uh, as well as uh, doing, do, they were doing a simultaneous webcast and satellite cast of their, um, of their uh, ser uh, sermons uh, overseas and intranet at the same time. Um, if you asked Koreans, where did you develop this style of, um, kind of church? And they would answer back, why not? We have the technology, so why not apply it to where um, it's useful for? And it's um, um, reflected in other countries as well. There is an Indian author who wrote a book called Mother Pious Lady, uh, which uh, coined the term instinct reduction devices in India. Um, he refers to uh, the dominant uh, values in the society as something that everyone should follow and take for granted, like marriage, university, uh, which uh, value science, commerce uh, major. And if you're not um, if you're totally hopeless, you may choose art and design <laughs> still in India. Um, or uh, jobs that are um, jobs that your parents or your family has been doing over the years. So new things that does not have any traditional root is an opportunity to break free because these uh, strong values in certain areas in, in your life is very, still very difficult to change. So the living in transition is not only applicable to the, the physical clothing or fashion, but also the, uh, the value and what we will readily um, adopt or change in lifestyle. And it does bring a fertile ground of inventions um, with a mind free from inhibitions of how things should be. And this is a um, versatile mobile phone battery charger that I found uh, in Chengdu in China. So you see that there are different um, kind of connectors here, which you can change the angle. So basically, it can be used to uh, charge any batteries in practice. <laughs> and it costs uh, only 20 yuan, which is about three Austrian dollars. And I thought this was a brilliant idea. Uh, and I can understand the background where this is coming from. The market uh, deals with a lot of secondhand devices as well as uh, fake devices. So the battery standards is basically non-existent. And, and therefore, someone uh, with a business mind cleverly uh, invented this kind of design. Um, the next point is that it is from the same market. Um, I couldn't find, well, I cannot bring all the pictures that I found. Um, but all the known luxury brands were present, if you like Cartier, uh, Prada, Versace. Uh, and you'd wonder, who would buy such products? And people, uh, I would say people generally live for the future rather than for the present, at least in the mindset. And it's partly because there is a lack of social security provided by the government. Um, but more importantly, people believe their lives will get better and can get better. And of course, it, not, it doesn't only stop on their generation, but the future generation. So this social mobility, uh, the optimism towards the social mobility nurtures two prominent phenomena. And one is investment on education, and second is investment in showing off or reminding oneself about the ideal image that they live for, especially the aspiration you have. And aspiration sometimes demands uh, perceivable tokens, like the device you own, uh, clothes you wear, 
um, and reassurances or reinforcement, like someone who goes into a diet buying a small size clothes, so that, or hang a photo of someone who has your ideal body. So a lot of European luxury brands live on this psychology and the desire to be associated with a brand that has been already proven to be for successful people. And this is a service I found uh, also in China called Blue Kiss. Essentially, it is a photo studio. And the difference is that it is for yourself. The service will provide you with all the necessary props like clothes and accessories, and you can transform yourself like, just like in the, um, the celebrities and advertisement in magazines. So while you cannot be the character in the real life now, you will see yourself in the photo album that you will receive to look how well deserved you could be. So um, this high aspiration, not all of them are ostentatious in nature. Um, and the incredible amount of investment in education um, is really a um, common character everywhere as well. I interviewed um, a prostitute living in favela in Rio. And we got to know her because uh, our interview other regular interview participants took care of her daughter while he was on the job um, in, in Copacabana Beach. And she had no, uh, when we met, she had no hesitation saying that she wants her daughter to be a doctor and get out of her favela living. As for her, she did not know what else to do to make money because that's what she has been doing since 14. And she didn't, didn't have any other education or uh, training to do otherwise. But her work had a really clear focus and she invested everything for her daughter's education. And as I said, it's the same everywhere. My cleaning lady I had in India spent all her income to send her kids to English school, whereas public schools were much cheaper because he, she thought their lives would be different from hers if they spoke English well. So I can reflect on my parents um, in in Korea, uh, who never took holidays longer than weekends trip all their life, basically. Uh, future is, uh, was full of uncertainty, so the best they could do was to um, live for the future rather than the present. Another point and another common character uh, is entrepreneurship. Um, interviewing in people in China is always amazing. And you will come across a lot of entrepreneurs. So this little booth was what uh, our interview participant called her mini shop. And it's actually uh, in a, within a shop that her friend owned selling clothes. Can you recognize the objects here? I guess the picture, the contrast of the picture is quite strong here. Um, basically, these are uh, samples of famous uh, foreign cosmetic brands. So she, uh, she's selling it, for instance, this um, small uh, sample of uh, facial cream. She's selling it for 15 yuan, which is uh, 1.5 pounds, so about $2.5 here. She definitely understands the market because uh, the tactic um, I guess it's uh, reflecting the tactic well known in the industry, like luxury brands making um, cheaper uh, products that people can buy, like perfume. I mean, you cannot probably own Hermes um, bag, but you can own a Hermes perfume. <laughs> How great. Uh, so this cascades down to this level of um, just getting what you probably would get for free if you bought the real product. She's using that as a business idea to sell at an expensive price for those who cannot really afford the real product. And I think um, this tactic has been used um, by some companies, uh, especially in um, kind of food and beverages or uh, consumer uh, good, fast moving consumer goods like uh, shampoos um, to package things really small so that people who cannot afford the big package can buy it uh, in, in very small bits. Another astonishing thing about entrepreneurship in uh, emerging market is people's learning power and willingness to change their course of life uh, through that. Um, this is a mobile phone repair shops. Um, 
and there are shops like this opened by people who may not be necessarily um, going through formal education. I interviewed a brother, um, two brothers who recently opened a repair shop uh, of their own in Ghana a few years ago. And one of the brothers basically went through a three month a course, which was a big investment for them. And the other brother worked at a mobile uh, phone shop and learned a few practical tricks uh, from that shop. So later on, they joined the forces and opened their own shop. And they shared um, whatever they learned. And the rest was basically supplied by the internet, the circuit map and parts list, whenever they needed a reference, because all the new models of mobile phones are keep coming up. So these fast-moving entrepreneurs are and will always be there um, and adapting to changes in the market really quickly, um, giving a distinct character to the foundation of this ecosystem in the market. And another trait I observed is um, ownership as a goal, which sounds quite vague, but I will explain. Um, so this is a lady who's uh, 33 years old. Um, she's a wholesaler of farming produce in market, basically vegetables um, and grains. Uh, she's working with her mother, who has been doing this business for generations. And, um, but she's um, planning her future uh, with her yet unknown future husband. Um, and she already lists her future husband as three most important people in her life. <laughs> so her goal is to get married. And by that, uh, she will become independent from her mother's business uh, and inherited uh, responsibilities. And she wanted to open a fashion shop of her own. What was interesting was that, um, I mean, she doesn't even have a fiance or even a candidate yet, but she has been preparing for her wedding for years. So um, this is her storage uh, room. And all the items in the black plastic bags on top of the, her wardrobe were basically things that she already prepared for her wedding. So among those uh, in the, so she of course wanted to show us what was in these plastic bags. And she, um, she took out this blender, uh, the hand blender that you can change the kind of different attachments. So for, for her, the blender was the most important item. She calls it her dowry. I could tell that there was a sense of pride in her saying that she managed to save up and bought this blender. When I asked her, um, why are you not using it now? And she said, well, it's for her life as a married woman, so she shouldn't use it now. And then I asked her, why did she buy it so early on then? Because I mean, in our perception, new, newer models will come out, which is probably cheaper and better. But, um, but um, she didn't seem to really understand the concept. And she did not have the anxiety of newer, better, cheaper models. For her, she, um, she would go uh, miles to maintain their cherished products like new. Um, and this one. She will, it was a sign that she actually um, achieved a milestone that she wanted to achieve. Um, so she wasn't really looking for uh, finding another product. Um, and I think um, this character probably could be quite tricky propositions for many uh, companies or brands uh, trying to advertise um, new product because um, we are so used to uh, artificial obsolescence in. Uh, especially technology products, because there is always, um, you know, after six months, there will be newer, better models, which is cheaper. And we always live with that anxiety. Uh, and we almost see it as a necessary evil to uh, make sense economically to run um, these consumer products in this market. But I guess um, there is a still opportunity um, to create um, different kind of mindset and possibly with a I mean, to see her, to see her how he, she cherishes the virgin experience, owning uh, something that's a sign of success. Um, there is another uh, thing which is quite difficult to describe, and it's probably not a common character, but I would say it's a common pattern that I observed. 
So when I moved to India from uh, London, I noticed I got text for, for bringing a used vacuum cleaner to the country. And the reason was that um, it was a typical household appliance in India. So lots of ele electronic appliances for home originates from the West, including washing machine, vacuum cleaner, and microwave. So the aspir aspirational value of Western-style living with a stress on the uh, convenience um, probably accelerated the adoption of home appliances. But for majority, it's not really something that they can readily um, purchase because of the price, but also because of the uh, strong tradition of using uh, human labor for those houseworks, as human labor is much cheaper. But of course, um, there are some areas where um, transition is not easily acceptable because of the different, um, cult for different standard or norm that people have. Um, so in Asia, in general, many homes take shoes off in the house. Um, and commonly, cleaning involves wiping with water. So, and my mom never trusted vacuum cleaner. Um, she thought vacuum cleaner is just like a surface, kind of really leaking the surface of the dirt. So it will never clean completely. So my sisters um, bought her Roomba robot cleaner. And basically, she it did not win her trust. So it was kind of getting the dust in the corner. The notion of hygiene in her mind needs to um, have water to complete the cleaning in order to effectively uh, get rid of all the dirt that needs to be removed. Um, so the, there's a, this cleaner, cleaner uh, product um, that a Korean company developed, um, which is red. And it cleans with water while allowing the user to retain uh, this upright position and using the vacuum cleaning uh, function. I haven't used it myself, but I was recommended to uh, take a look at this product. Um, I guess it was developed in India, uh, uh, sorry, developed in Korea to fill that gap of unsatisfying performance of the vacuum cleaner. This um, not good enough notion is often coming from the distinct reference point of how things were done before. And some things can be compromised as, as it is convenient, but some cannot be. Um, another example of my mom was that um, she, she uh, got the, uh, as a professional wife, uh, she got the uh, washing machine, which was front loading. And she thought that was also really an inconvenient because she couldn't actually hack the, um, the washing machine cycle by putting in kind of extra washing in the middle of the cycle and so forth. Um, so she actually uh, um, <laughs> bought another kind of mini unit to complement the missing functions that she wanted. And I guess um, it shows off I guess it's not necessarily um, a similar level of um, cultural norm, strong cultural norm applied to new uh, things. Um, and, but there are a lot of um, cultural um, kind of traditions or taboos or uh, symbolisms that may not be apparent to the global companies. Um, I don't know the origin of numerology, but in China, there has been a whole branch of fortune telling around numbers. So naturally, fast entrepreneurs found the opportunity to get the premiums on the good mobile phone numbers. So we came across these ladies around the mobile phone market in China uh, while with a list of mobile phone numbers on offer and the respective fortune of each number indicated. So like, some of these signs indicate that it's extra good numbers. <laughs> um, so all the religions and cultural conventions that consider certain things auspicious or the opposite uh, is, can influence the product development quite strongly. Um, for instance, product numbers uh, in China is always different from the global numbers because the number four cannot be used as it, the pronunciation of number four is same as death in Chinese. So p phenomenon like this uh, could be quite difficult to predict or control, um, but being aware of it may provide you an opportunity to utilize it in a positive way, at, on the other hand. 
So the next point is probably universal across cultures, but I would say it's probably slightly more pronounced in emerging economies. So for the majority, design in many societies, the design, the term design is uh, almost synonymous to fashion and style, the visual style. In other words, it's quite distant from things that are practical and convenient or affordable. Designed things or designer labels or designer uh, designed things are the opposite of practical uh, in many cases. And outside of the fashion or architecture, the originality of the design of the artifact or even an invisible process or, um, or service is rarely discussed as a design subject. So in this domain of making everyday choices, um, people turn to their instinct, basically. We leave the brand awareness um, behind here. And it was uh, taken in a taxi on the front uh, dashboard, and this was um, air refreshener bottle. Um, it was not taken on the front of the car. I don't think the taxi driver was not even was even aware of the uh, the brand or associated that um, uh, that brand in making the product choices that he, when he bought the product. I think it's especially true in cultures with long and rich history where people grew up surrounded by artifacts that have uh, descended over a long period of time that no one raised the question of the originality of the form or who, who came up with the form in the first place. Like, um, this is a festival of goods uh, in India. Um, and this elephant god is called Ganesh. Um, but no one really um, questions who designed the Ganesh uh, embodiment. Because obviously it's highly stylized with someone's imagination, uh, but this um, this culture of um, I mean you you uh, get exposed to these various objects that are obviously uh, important in your everyday life, but you never really question the origin, and therefore there is a kind of habit of not really questioning where things are designed. And places like kitchen at home really directly reflects uh, the same attitude. It is an area that's ruled by practicality, and it could be really difficult for people to imagine paying for premium for a subjective value alone, like, oh, I like this color, hence I, I would pay more for it. Uh, so, and also, the established work process dictates a perception of what's needed. A lot of homes uh, have house help, as I mentioned earlier, um, which considerably delay the modernization of the kitchen. My cleaning lady in India had a cleaning lady at home because there's a, always a poorer person than you. Um, and what this means is a new cost system of design is created, both in consumers' and designers' mind. And something like a low and high design subject, it, would create, um, it does create uh, the design-worthy items list in people's perception making people focus lar largely on kind of show off products like clothes or mobile phones uh, as a design worthy subject. Um, but in this kitchen items, which is a quite a kind of standardized um, household object in uh, India, it's made of stainless steel, so it's virtually indestructible. So a lot of uh, people basically prepare this set uh, when they get married because it's probably lifetime guaranteed. Um, and um, only the, um, the products that can be broken, uh, like ceramic cups, are used only for special guests. So um, if you look at technology companies, um, a lot more investment is made for fancy technology that will create the whole kind of wow effect rather than catering for kind of lingering or long-term needs. And everyone's, um, everyone wants a spotlight. If it's easier, the better. Um, and we talked about a lot of um, the digital um, internet adoptions in India. And one of the topics that we studied extensively was uh, use of native language on mobile phones, because it's so difficult to use native language on uh, mobile phones or a computer keyboard, unless you actually spend some time training yourself uh, using it. But very few companies um, 
make an investment. And because of that chicken and egg problem, uh, people actually start thinking that, well, I would rather learn English rather than using uh, my local language on these technologies, which I will not go into detail today. Um, but I have given uh, other talks on that topic uh, in different uh, venues. Uh, the next point I would like to, I, I really feel dearly about and often get really fascinated by is um, the human infra, which is not visible. Uh, the invisible uh, infrastructure has a strong uh, root on the social network, which is basically people. Uh, again, in India, I lived in a residential house in a neighborhood called uh, Indranagar in Bangalore. Uh, and my landlady didn't really explain much about how things worked around the house, like um, how do I get rid of rubbish? I had no idea. Um, so I was looking for some official garbage collection system or a place that I could just bring my garbage at least. But when I started to look around, I realized that there is a lot of things that I did not notice happening around in the neighborhood, partly because I was not there during the daytime. Um, but so I had to learn it from other people that there are people for, there, basically there wasn't a system of public service, but there were people for everything. So instead of, um, having a official garbage uh, collection service, my friend came to my house and found a lady who was in charge of uh, collecting garbage on my street. She was not an official uh, person allocated for it, but she wa it was her personal enterprise by offering a uh, service to uh, the neighbors uh, living in that street. Um, so basically after paying her, her a few rupees, um, I could just leave my garbage, garbage bag in the front uh, gate and it just magically disappeared. I, I had no idea where it went, but that's how everything uh, worked in that neighborhood. Um, all of these were, um, and, and there was a, and I wondered about uh, this noise I heard every morning, which was turned out to be paper. And there was a guy uh, on a bicycle running around the neighborhood uh, every morning um, asking for paper. And we were really surprised. So we prepared a pile of paper to get rid of from the, from the house. And I was really surprised that he actually offered to pay me money for taking those uh, pile of paper. <laughs> um, basically, it was a, a guy from this um, recycling center. And it was a convention to pay, the, pay people to get the paper because they are actually recycling business and they're making something out of it. So um, all of these um, kind of tips were practically invisible to the foreign eye. Uh, I could only learn it by living there uh, in person and asked other people for their advice. And there was a little presence of government but a lot of personal enterprises and, and uh, I asked my Indian colleague the other day, what he misses most from his uh, old India. And he said the dependency network. His sister's wedding had 1,500 people. And he said it's not going to be uh, possible for his son's wedding because it's changing in India as well. Um, still, I'm sure he would expect a few uh, hundreds of people for the wedding, if not more. So when you're blessed with so many people who readily come to um, help you in big events like wedding, the dependency network in your physical uh, surroundings, um, inherent, there are a lot of services that you get naturally and take for granted. Um, and this is a free cycle website. It's very popular in London, which is um, quite a different uh, scale. Um, as far as I know, especially among those who have children, because you can get a lot of un, um, unnecessary things that you, can, you want to get rid of through this website. And, and I guess um, this, is a, this is a mechanism that we develop in developing uh, developed world to uh, compensate for the absence of that dependency network in your immediate physical surroundings. Um, I guess... Um, while a service like this could still find its value uh, in India in the future, a lot of people would not necessarily have the need for it um, for now, as long as they have their hundreds of close relatives and friends um, and the dependency network. Although we can predict that it will probably change quite soon. 
And on this subject, this is a slightly different spin on the infrastructure. What do you imagine when you hear about the rural healthcare? And what do you think the real challenge is? I went to the several uh, rural health centers in West India, beginning of um, um, 2010. And I was really amazed at the fact that the whole system was built on field workers uh, called um, ashas, visiting families at least once a week because the health centers are so far away from the homes and uh, someone had to go to the villages um, instead of them coming to the health centers uh, to be able to retain uh, some basic checkups. So their food work, as there was no obvious options for transportation, um, was what made the healthcare's existence in the, and uh, the lack of doctors available. Um, so their key strength is the social network itself. So basically, these ASHA workers uh, knew everyone in the village. So um, they were the key link between the knowledge and technology center and the real people as well. Because village people, uh, with them, uh, village people would be exposed to uh, new uh, kind of news, what's happening in the other parts of the uh, world. So pictured here is a portable vaccination pack with the coolers inside. So when there's a need for vaccination, field workers will have to bring this pack in their food journey to villages that they were responsible for. And they're also responsible for bringing information in. So in fact, 60% of their time is unfortunately spent on documenting information rather than um, doing more inter uh, interactions with, uh, uh, with the people that they have to care for. And we were actually doing a project called Health Radar, which is a, a mobile reporting system for malaria outbreaks. Um, and you'd question, what about using computers to make some of this process easier and faster? And um, many of the health centers do have computers because the government made a program to make sure that every health center have the computer. But they were under dust covers. And it's because computers did not come with a person who can teach people, other people how to use them. So without someone knowing how to use it, it is practically useless. So factoring in um, the roles of human being, and people should be part of a regular design process almost, I would say. It happens quite often in technology design uh, that I would rather ask, why is this better than what people are doing already, or human service? So while it can be a sustainable act in the long run, um, the challenge is that training the human capital is a big investment and commitment, if possible at all. So for instance, why is computer didn't come with a person? I guess it comes to use the computer um, at, at, the, at present requires the knowledge of English. And having those um, kind of basic education that we take for granted is not necessarily available in the scale that is necessary in the government um, managing kind of rural population. And I guess uh, this is exactly the reason why the speed of change and adoption of technology is in a way amazingly fast, but is slowed down in many parts of the world. So um, a few things I mentioned so far, you probably knew most of them, and you'd um, appreciate the difficulty in characterizing uh, such a diverse uh, group of people. But these are things that uh, keep fascinating me, as there are still very few uh, success stories how this opportunity can be um, used. And uh, this is a picture of artwork installation by Anish Kapoor. He's an Indian-born ar ar artist um, working in London. And obviously, uh, very successful. He did uh, also a London Olympic uh, installation uh, and won Turner Prize. And um, he was interviewed by uh, the British newspaper Guardian, um, and he mentioned that he's very, he was very frightened to have uh, his first ever uh, exhibition in India, which is his home country. And he said, I still have my relatives there, so I hope they will approve my artwork. And I think his sentiment summarizes how designers should feel for um, new markets or innovation opportunities. Because after all, all innovation is, is about relevance and adoption rather than the inventiveness of the idea itself. 
So there are two key questions to me, uh, essentially um, the challenges. How can we create the emotional uh, ownership and bonding uh, of any designed object or service that we are creating? Um, understanding the subtle nuances of the social and cultural her heritage and sentiments. Um, this is a very common car in India called Ambassador, and it started manufacturing uh, in India by a Hindustan company in 1958. Um, but the design and technology was essentially British company. And um, you, you see lots of them. Uh, apparently, Sonia Gandhi is still riding this car, although I, I'm not sure if it's true still now. Uh, my friend uh, running a company called Center for Knowledge Society in India uh, introduced uh, the notion of used in, in India rather than made in India uh, because there is a strong emotional bonding. He says it's essentially Indian because Indians love it. And we see um, uh, a few products that locals are not even aware of the fact that it's a foreign brand, like Milo, uh, the chocolate tasting drink in Thailand, or Vicks in India. So while some brands take advantage of uh, the status of being foreign brands, uh, hence being more desirable, but some take the approach of totally localizing their marketing and design for the local market. And of course, I cannot prescribe here what the answer to this question is today, but it is important to consider these emotional touch points so people are made to feel that they can approach the product, the brand, the design that you are working on. And it can be a small, tiny, trivial thing. So my Indian colleague always commented on the fact that the trash con icon on computers or mobile phones um, do not look anything like what, what people are familiar with in, in India. <laughs> It's a metaphor. The second question is uh, nurturing the right environment for growth, um, leading to sustainable uh, business. <coughs> so another example I brought here is um, what's called, um, um, well, it's created by a lady named Punam Bir Kachuri. Um, uh, Obviously, Bangalore produces 2,200 tons of um, organic waste every day, but the central government can only um, produce um, a, a process composi composting uh, waste up to 500 tons a day. So basically, 70% of waste in average in Indian homes are organic wet waste. Uh, so mo mo and most gardens uh, have most houses in India have garden areas. So this is a product called Daily Dump, uh, which uh, the, the creator calls it as a composting brand product and a service bundle. Um, we had one uh, at home as well in India. So basically you put the kind of wet waste on the top container and as it gets decomposted, it, the waste comes down and you get the final kind of dry, kind of composted uh, waste in the bottom. And uh, she calls this as an open source business model because the physical product itself uh, is made by the local craftsman who has existing skills uh, making pottery. Um, and he, she's creating a lot of jobs in the neighborhood because um, it's not, and the, the product is not uh, just uh, to, to be sold um, at the point of purchase, but there is a sustained, a sustained um, kind of service relationship because I, like as personal, uh, personally, I don't really have any idea about what to do with the compost. So uh, the company will, when you purchase the product, the company will actually uh, send people to your home every month to take care of the gar uh, waste produced here and collect um, the waste and use it in a, um, well, in a good ways, uh, either for your garden or if you're not garden into gardening, uh, someone else who needs them. So um, I know uh, my talk was quite uh, uh, probably not about design or technology and had a very uh, abstract uh, notions. Um, I tried to focus on something that you probably haven't seen much uh, in the media before. So to sum up, I also brought another strange image <laughs> I wanted to share with you. Uh, we had a community design competition to design your ideal mobile phone a few years ago. Um, and we went to three cities. Um, and one of them was uh, in Ghana, a Liberian refugee camp called Budivuram. 
Um, and this participant, um, I mean, everyone uh, voluntarily participated in creating their design um, story. And, uh, and he's a 25-year-old computer student, as, as, as he calls it. And he wanted a mobile phone uh, with a solar charging, with a very big keyboard, with voice-aided keypad input for his grandmother, who has really bad eyesight. And he also thought that it would be useful to um, have the phone when there's uh, no light because there's often power cut in the community. And when I asked why, I mean, he didn't mention anything about this, so I had to ask separately, why is a phone in the shape of a foot? And he answered, because the foot is a symbol for development. Um, so like this, I encounter a lot of optimism when I meet people in uh, so-called emerging market, in especially in association with uh, new technology and better products. Uh, that they could own at the moment. And that really humbles me. When we take it for so granted that we have internet and connected devices, and yet we do not necessarily see the potentials that it could really bring to us if we tried harder. And as designers, I would say that we are in the business of infusing aspiration and ultimately uh, happiness in people's life. So I hope um, we use our position well. So that's uh, my talk, and um, you probably wonder what this image was. It's uh, done by the same artist that uh, I showed uh, with a beginning picture. So if you look closely, this is all made with the everyday artifacts, like cups. Uh, so he's again making a very different object experience uh, using the everyday trivial objects. So that was my long talk, and <laughs> thank you for your patience and spending the evening time with me today.